Let's go on and knock out this SEC Rewind. Uh, I, I want to do one of these for each conference. I think this will be a lot of fun. Basically go over the best games, the best players, who exceeded expectations, who underachieved, etc., and then some of the coaching changes. Uh, best games. I've got a list down. You uh, Do you have a list, or do you want me to uh, just kind of roll through mine? For the best games? Yeah. Like, of the of the Of the season? SEC season, yeah. I mean, no, I've got a, I've got a couple that I know off the top of my head. I, you know, go on and tell me we what's, what's, a, go on and tell me off your head, and uh, and then I will mark them off of my list right quick. Uh, Arkansas, Ole Miss, and Oxford. Yes. So I had that. Uh, I put that as number eight. Uh, really, it should have been higher, but it, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I think I'm looking at this more as like memorable games, and that one was a lot of fun. It was on it was at the an same time. Game. I can't. Yeah. I, I mean, I literally just pulled that out of my ass, but that's. Incredible I think game. That's the be- I think that was the best game of the season in the SEC. Yes. I really do. Yes. It was super competitive. It was super back and forth. It was big play after big play. You've got a kid that grew up 15 minutes away from Ole Miss football stadium playing quarterback for Arkansas. It just the storylines, the big plays after big plays, it came down to a, 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 a two-point conversion to, to end it. I mean, I just I loved everything about it. It was just a perfect, perfect Oxford Day. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, Texas A&M 41, Alabama 38, I had as number one. Because it, it, the most people watch that, the most people seem to remember that one. Uh, the bad thing for the Ole Miss-Arkansas game was there were so many other people that were watching Red River at the exact same time. Because Red River was bananas. But, you're t- you know? but hang on, now, that's not what we're talking about. Right, Best right, right. game. It's, okay, so, so A&M-Alabama was up there. So mainly... It, I'm just not, I, maybe I shouldn't even just put rankings on here, but we'll talk about some of these. Uh, Alabama Auburn in four overtimes was uh, it wasn't a well played game, but it that was that exciting. Cl- just the close <laughs> game and best game ain't the same thing. That wasn't a good game, but at, for anything at all. The uh, Georgia Clemson game to start the season that started it off for Georgia. That was a that was an interesting game. Neither offense could do anything against the other defense. Uh, it was JT Daniels' team at that point, and Georgia completely shifted since then. But you saw early on the signs that this defense is going to be absurd. And they were all season, hence why they won the national championship. Uh, I wrote down Arkansas 40, Texas 21. That was Arkansas's coming out party, right? Like, it was, it was yeah. I, I think, a little bit shocking that they were able to dismantle Texas in the way that they did. And it let everybody know that Arkansas was going to be really, really good. And partly that, that Texas yeah, was not going to be great this season. But it wasn't so much that they weren't going to be great because they lost to Arkansas. Like, Arkansas was good. Like, well, it, the like Arkansas we just A&M game was amazing. And yep. then the other game that comes to my mind immediately is Tennessee-Kentucky. Tennessee-Kentucky I've got on here as well. I've got, let's see, Ole Miss 31, Tennessee 26. Of course, everybody throwing everything on the field, et cetera. Yep. Uh, but that was an incredibly interesting game, a fun game. Seeing Matt Corral just it, 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 Ole Miss, I almost – I don't know what to really make of that game because Ole Miss's offense couldn't really get going, but their defense played so well, and Tennessee couldn't get anything going either. But it was the chess match between those two was awesome. So I loved that one. LSU 49, Florida 42. Shocker, right? That one was a lot of fun to watch because... Yeah, it's probably the most shocking outcome of the season. LSU well, no, could do... No, South, South Carolina, Florida would have been the most shocking. Yeah, I've got South season. Carolina, Florida all the way down at the bottom. Because that was a complete ass trophy. Yeah, that was a... Just, <laughs> what, 40, 40 to 15, something like that. Just a complete disaster of a football game. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But LSU, Florida, LSU's offense had been able to do basically nothing yep. all season. And and they come out, and that, that was kind of the beginning of the end for Dan Mullen, was, man, you, you have lost to these dudes two times in a row when they've got very little to play for. Like, right. what is it? Because... LSU was coming off of being beaten at Kentucky by three touchdowns. <laughs> it was just insane. Florida was like a two-touchdown favorite in that game. Alabama 31, Florida 29. That was inter- that, that lets you know immediately this is not the same Alabama team that you are used to watching. But also, like, how different is this season for Florida if they get that thing done? Right? It kind of this is going back into the multiverse kind of thing, right? 
Like yeah. what what changes? What butterfly effect goes in there if Florida is able to hit that two point conversion and then win in overtime? You gotta you gotta think Florida wins another game that they like they don't lose to South Carolina if they beat Alabama because some weird juju happens, right? Or they don't lose to LSU because, you know, just something different happens in the guys, you know, a confidence or or a swagger or something of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the the Kentucky Florida game, which was gross and disgusting to watch. It was a 2013 win for Kentucky, but at, they had a special teams touchdown. Kentucky's offense could do nothing against Florida's defense, but Florida's offense kept giving them the ball and just, oh, it was a mess, absolute mess. But um, and you then talk about the butterfly effect, A and M Alabama. Think about if that game is two weeks earlier. The two weeks before that game, A and M lost to Arkansas and to Mississippi State back to back. If they beat if they beat Bama and then play Arkansas and Mississippi State, I guarantee you they win one of those two games, if not both of them. Agreed. Because Agreed. this is what confidence does. This is what because after they beat Bama, they go on a run. Yeah, and they and they're not going on a run, a little run. They go on a run and they're killing everybody. Yes, yes. Uh, they got to they got to Ole Miss and they fell fell apart against yeah. Ole Miss. Yeah, lost that one and then lost to LSU to end the season. That's why they ended up eight and four. But this was a team that uh, that had two losses. That if they could have gotten Alabama beat somewhere else, any of these other games that were close, Arkansas, LSU, Auburn, whatever. A&M, had they won out, would have gone to the SEC championship game. If they find a way to beat Georgia, that's your first two-loss team in the college football playoff, in the four-team format. So, And then the last one that I wrote down was Auburn 24 and LSU 19. That was like the Bonex coming out party. That was the, for all intents and purposes, the end of the Ed Orgeron era at LSU. That was a pretty, pretty big game. Uh, best players. So I, I wrote down several here, and... And I'll see if I'll get your opinion on these. How's that? So, Nicobe Dean and Jordan Davis, linebacker and defensive lineman from Georgia. I went ahead and, and put them together uh, because you could take basically Georgia's entire roster, really, and put it put it up there for best players in the SEC. But those are the two that I think stood out. Those were the two that I feel like meant the most to their national championship run. Like those two are freaks, absolute freaks. For Alabama. There's a trifecta there, Bryce Young, uh, Jameson Williams, and uh, Will Anderson. Those three, I think, were the, the three biggest names, the ones that meant the most to Alabama's run. Uh, without any one of those pieces, this whole thing falls apart. Just completely falls apart. Uh, Arkansas, Traylon Burks, the wide receiver. I think he was the most important player for Arkansas this season. Obviously, the defense uh, stood up at certain times when they had to. K.J. Jefferson was great. Burks was just the guy. When you needed a big play, he was the dude. You uh, you kind of feel the same on that one? Yeah, no, I think I think he's got a chance to be the best receiver in this draft class, too. Most certainly. For Kentucky, I think it is very fitting that the guy that I wrote down is Darian Kennard, the offensive tackle. He was incredible this season and has been his entire career there. He's going to be a first-round draft pick this year. But that's that's how Kentucky gets these things done, man. That's how they win is they are able to dominate at the line of scrimmage in in a yeah, way they, that, they've got they've got uh, a couple of defensive guys that, that oh, yeah. really really stood up and and had had unbelievable seasons too. Most certainly. Most certainly. For Missouri. Missouri ended up going to a bowl game. Like it surprised everybody and we'll talk about it, underachieved, overachieved, whatever. Tyler Beatty, the running back. I don't think anybody expected anything out of out of Missouri. And no, the defense couldn't stop the run, et cetera. And they had issues at quarterback with Connor Bazelak. And then they ended up going up with uh, with a couple other guys throughout the season when he got injured. But Tyler Beatty was consistent week in, week out, and had massive, massive games when a lot of people did not believe that he would. Auburn, Roger McCreary, the cornerback. Now, we could have put Bo Nix on here, I think. But, you know, Nix got hurt. Team fell apart, et cetera. But that defense was still lights out, and it had to do with my, Roger McCreary. I think, I think he might be the best cornerback in the SEC this year. McCreary, oh, McCreary was awesome, man. Like he was, yeah. like yeah. he, I, he I was. Might, I might give you that. I he was consistently that. put he was on the really, best receiver. Really good. Yeah, I was trying to think of some other guys that that we're not thinking of, but he was really, really good. He's up. Yeah, there. Uh, Matt Corral, quarterback at Ole Miss. Uh, Ole Miss does not go ten and two without Matt Corral. Like Bob, Ole Miss doesn't make a bowl game without yeah. Matt Corral. I really yeah. believe I really believe that Matt's that good. He he might be the MVP of the league 
Yeah, I think year. he's the best player in the SEC. I, I, and I've got Mississippi State friends that give me so much shit, and they think that I'm blowing that guy and, and I'm over because they only want to look at numbers. I've watched these football games, okay? And the reason his numbers sucked in a lot of those games is because the rest of the team sucks, yes. okay? Yes. And they're just not – they're not super talented anywhere, all right? Matt Corral pulled them out of everything they got. Oh, yeah. Uh, the when defense he needed to run, was, he could run. When he need to throw, he could throw. He always made something happen, and and he did it by himself a lot. Yeah. No, he became a, a fantastic decision maker, right? Like, that's that's yeah. the biggest thing is when he was a freshman, kind of a hothead, had had some issues. That, I mean, didn't even start. Like, he wasn't even, wasn't even playing. And once Lane Kiffin got there last season, completely changed. Like, he developed this kid. It just ridiculously developed. Uh, Texas A&M, DeMarvin Leal, the defensive lineman, I think – I think that's the way that you go on this. I mean, obviously oh, they've got Spiller too. Sp- yeah, Spiller was great. Sp- um, Spiller, Spiller carried that team through some of those rough, rough, tight games where just Calzano just couldn't get it done. Yeah. No, the offense young, had major young issues. And experienced and, and and Spiller was all they had, but he he did a lot with very little. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. For Mississippi State, now we can say Will Rogers. We can come up with somebody on defense. I put Charles Cross on here, the offensive tackle. I, I, now that I'm looking at it, like Cross is great. Obviously, he's going to be a first round NFL draft pick, but but maybe it should have been Will Rogers. Like it's, it, it's got to be, it's got to be Will. Yeah, it's just got to be that that he's, that team doesn't do anything if Will Rogers is not good. Like no, and they, well, when Will Rogers wasn't good, they did nothing. Yeah, that's the thing. Like I mean, you could see it when when he had great performances, they put up ungodly numbers. When he didn't, they were awful. Yes. Yes, indeed. And then finally, last one, Tennessee wide receiver Velas Jones Jr. Uh, he was a USC transfer, but this kid did everything. Uh, kick returns, you know, it caught a ton of passes this year. Uh, Hendon Hooker it is likely the uh, the most important player for them. Uh, but Velas Jones, I thought, was was fantastic this year. And we don't want this to just be like all the best quarterbacks in the league, right? So I, I thought Velas Jones was was awesome. There were other guys for Tennessee as well. They did a really good job of, of spreading the ball out. Let's uh, let's talk about who exceeded uh, exceeded expectations, met expectations, and who underachieved. Exceeded expectations. I've got Ole Miss going ten and two. Well, ten and three if you got the uh, the Sugar Bowl. Arkansas got to nine wins, nine and four. Kentucky another ten win season, two in the last four years. Tennessee at seven and six exceeded expectations. You agree with that? Uh, I'll agree with that. And so, uh, bowl game yeah, aside, no, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. No, I'm not going to give them that because I think I think that was my expectation for them, or or maybe even more. Interesting, uh, with, with what they lost after last year, with all the stuff that went on with Jeremy Pruitt, them making a bowl game, I thought was exceeding expectations. Uh, you might you might be right, but my expectations were higher than everybody else's. I thought this team could be good, and I know Josh Heupel's a good coach. I know a yeah. lot of people well didn't think that. I do. Yeah. So that makes sense. South Carolina seven and six also put exceeding expectations. Absolutely yeah. exceeding expectations. Yeah, Shane Beamer uh has has established a culture already in Columbia. So that is, you know, that makes sense. Uh as far as teams that met expectations, Georgia, obviously, they met their expect I don't think they exceeded expectations. They were a national title contender. Just because you win a national title does not mean that you exceed the expectation. Alabama thirteen and two met expectations. You know. Everybody knew there'd be a little bit of a drop off going forward this year. Uh, you could say they exceeded by getting to the national title game. I, no, this team met expectations. I mean, just bottom line. Mississippi State seven and six. They lost the bowl game, but they went seven and five. They they exceeded their win total for the year. But this is about what we expected from this team: six and six, seven and five, somewhere around there. You know, you expect the bump in year two of Mike Leach. So you uh, you agree with that? Uh, I think so. All right, and then met expectations. Last one, Missouri, six and seven. I, I, I think getting to a bowl game was was what everybody kind of expected, right? Like it, it, there was a chance they could have gone five and seven, they could have gone seven and five, and they ended up six and six. They lost their bowl game, but like six and six, getting to a bowl is is about what we expected out of Missouri this year. Uh, as far as teams that underachieved, we're going to put Vandy on here at two and ten. Although maybe that was their expectation to begin with, we didn't expect much out of them. Auburn six and seven, that was underachieved. Now that could have been completely different had Bonex gotten hurt or not gotten hurt, right? Yeah. 
LSU, six and seven. That is underachieving at LSU for sure. Texas A and M, eight and four. That's underachieving. Like, yeah, but so if you're giving Auburn some kind of weird ass pass, you're not going to give A uh, and M a pass for losing their starting quarterback week two. I, like they yeah. got to play the entire season with a backup that they weren't expecting to play through the SEC team. I, I uh, think the calendar, and he's not really good. So so. Normally, yes, normally I would have put them at like met expectations. But when when you get through the bad part and you lose to Arkansas, you lose to Mississippi State, like that's okay because you beat Alabama and then you go on this run, right? But then you get caught you by Ole Miss, Ole Miss to LSU. and you lose to LSU. I think that's I think that's below what their expectations were coming into this season. I mean, they were they were ranked in the top know, five or six. I just, like I understand that. I understand that. But I'm telling you, if you tell me your your starting quarterback goes down week two in the middle of a game and, and, and against Colorado, and you're going to play the rest of the, the year with with Matt Calzada, and you tell me they get to eight wins, I think everybody at AM takes that. Probably so. Maybe, maybe that should be a meet expectations. That's, that's the diff- so. That's the difference. Is is what do you think of Calzada? And what do you think people thought of him before the season started? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, it depends on the definition of expectations. Is the expectations before the season or in the middle of the season, right? Like well, it, they got to change. They got to change at some point. Something, when something like that happens, if Matt Corral gets hit by a bus, like the expectation for Ole Miss has to change. Yes. They can't stay the same. That would be That would be irrelevant. That wouldn't make sense. If Nick Saban had a stroke on the middle of the sideline in week one, the expectation for Alabama has to change. Yeah. No, you're, you're not wrong about that. Uh, the so last... like you, you just can't say, well, we had them winning the national title, <laughs> and they didn't. So they didn't meet the expectations. Yeah. Yeah, that happened because something major happened. Something catastrophic happened. True, true. Uh, the last one that I've got for underachieved was Florida. Six and oh, seven. Yeah. Dan Mullen obviously loses his job. Uh, that that place. I mean, I I still cannot get over how quickly that thing unraveled. I mean, Gainesville was just a disaster this year. Good lord! And then finally, we got uh, we got two coaching changes to get through. Uh, LSU obviously parted ways with Ed Orgeron, brought in Brian Kelly. Still think a perfect hire, perfect hire because you just needed somebody to come in and reestablish what is going in. You got a you got a great coach in Baton Rouge now. So, you know, we'll see what all goes on. The coaching staff, staff, staff is done. Is, staff is fully hired. Yep. And uh, a player that LSU doesn't want won't leave the state. That's interesting. A player that LSU doesn't want won't leave the state. Who is that? I said that right. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, going forward. Oh, oh, oh. If LSU wants a kid, he's going to LSU. If yes. you're from Louisiana and you want to play at LSU and they want you, you're going there and you're not leaving. Bottom line. Yeah, I, zero, I tend to agree. Zero kids are getting out of the state that LSU doesn't want. Oh, yeah. Bring, LSU wants. Sorry, bringing I, back I, Frank Wilson. Way too many negatives in that, and I got confused. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, see what you're, I see what you were trying to say. Frank Wilson being hired on as the recording co- uh, recruiting coordinator was just perfect. Well, it's not perfect just hire. him. I mean, the oh, no, it's staff everything. is nothing but Louisiana guys. Yeah. It, it they, was, took, they took a guy from Boston. And everyone said he can't win in the South, and all he did was do what he always does, hires great, great staff. Agreed. And then Florida brought in Billy Napier from uh, Louisiana, you know, Louisiana Lafayette. And that one was an interesting one because it was completely different than the way that LSU went about their hire. And I think can still work, but... Well, the ADs that run these two programs are completely different. Completely different. Completely Completely different. different. It's does it? I I don't know that it's better or worse, right? Uh, I think it's just different ways of going about it. The problem is, is Florida's notoriously been cheap their entire life. That's that's what I was about to get at. To be to be a big boy in the SEC now, you got to start paying like a big boy. When you know when Ole Miss is doubling up the salary of your coach, at some point in time, you got to say. How long are you going to be able to keep great coaches in Florida and attract great people in Florida? And don't get me wrong, I understand Florida's point of view. They were dead last to the table in the SEC outside of Vanderbilt for uh, facilities and and thinking those things were important. I think Billy Napier is a great coach. 
I also think if you're not willing to break open the checkbook and sign somebody to seven to nine million dollars because that's what great coaches are going for now, then you know at some point in time he's just going. To use, Florida's going to be a yeah. stepping stone program, right? When, when you said break open the checkbook, it's it's not even so much paying Billy Napier. It's making sure staff that the staff gets paid and that everything that you need at the school gets taken care of. Right? Yes. Georgia just won a national championship. Georgia's recruiting budget is a million dollars more than the next highest in the SEC, and that's Alabama. Like that, you got to have great players. You got to be able to do all these different things. And Billy Napier could have success. That's right. But I think Billy Napier is a great coach. I think Billy Napier is going to be good. I also think that Florida brings on its own a lot of problems. How great could Florida have been over the last decade if they just used all that football TV money that they've been getting? Agreed. What are they doing with it? You got, I guess, working on on other stuff at the school, like, like other. Well, they are programs? paying like seven coaches at one time, all the time. Yeah, because they yeah. can't hit on a coaching hire. <laughs> well, you know, at, at some point in time, fire the athletic director because he's got a hit on a coach. Yeah, yeah. Strickland uh, bringing in, like, obviously his first head coaching hire was, uh, at least in uh, football, was Dan Mullen, and Dan Mullen was incredibly successful at Mississippi State when he worked with Scott Strickland. Florida is a different beast. It just is. You know, and and we'll see what ends up going forward. He hasn't had to make a basketball coaching hire. He's only been there, you know, a short while. But, I mean, Mike White's not exactly tearing it up in basketball. So, we'll see. Now, at gymnastics, all, you, we can start going through sport by sport. Like, Florida's still in, in good shape. But it's fine. That's not why the athletic director is paid. Right. They're not there don't for hire an athletic director to hire the gymnastics coach. Agreed. You just don't. Stanford doesn't hire an athletic director to hire a swim coach, even it, though they're the best in the world at swim. Right. That no, 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 that's not why you hire the AD. Exactly. Because Football, there's two sports that, there are two sports that make yep. you money and you hire them to make and run the two things that make you money. So you can do the other things. Agreed. There's there's two main revenue sports. It's those two: football and basketball. They are the front porch of your baseball university. Baseball is getting up there, and Florida's kind of going backwards in that. They used yes. to be awesome at baseball, and okay. the rest of the SEC is pat is la- some of them are lapping them, and the rest of them is just passing them. No, you're right about that. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at WinningCures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.